Good Monday morning, everybody. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. We had a great weekend here. We had a young man in the church I was formerly at give his life to Christ, and we baptized him. So that was exciting. So congratulations to Messiah Lee Harper for giving his life to Jesus. I think he's 11 years old. And man, I'll tell you what, just one of those kids, you know that if he stays on fire for God, he's going to do something very special. So I want to say congratulations to him. And if you're out there and you do, uh, you're actively praying, please pray for my friend Carson, who broke his neck in a car accident. He's going to be on a neck brace for a while and his girlfriend, Lexi. So please keep them in your prayers. If you don't, if you don't mind, and if you have any, please feel, uh, feel free to send them. And I have had several actually, uh, between here and some of the other things that uh, I work on. So we've had a few. So today we're in uh, lesson number 24 as we go through the book of Mark together. We're in Mark chapter 7, and this is verse 24. And we know that Jesus has been on the, not on the run, but he's been on the, like his tour preaching and teaching. And at the last place he was at, he was arguing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And now he's going to try to get away from that area Try to get maybe some quiet time, some downtime, but he is way too popular for that right now, as we see. He's going to go to a house, and he's going to try to relax, because remember, the last two houses he was in, one, somebody broke through the ceiling to let uh, the, the crippled man in, and the other one that was so tight in the house, they couldn't even sit down or have any room to eat. So Jesus is kind of like trying to get away from the crowd, and you're going to see here that that's not very possible. Here we're going to have a woman that approaches him. She's a Gentile. She is outside of the, the, the Jewish or the Hebrew children's faith. But I like her. And, I, and we'll look at this in a minute. But I really like her. If you're a guy like me that was in the military, you like tough girls. And I kind of look at her as being a tough girl. Maybe she had a few tattoos. And she was going to talk to Jesus. And she was not taking no for an answer. So... Uh, anyway, uh, I just like, I like a girl that can give it back to you. If, if you're dishing out, she's coming back at you. Anyway, just a personal thing there, but I like this because it shows the strength of this, this woman, the perseverance and even, and even the desperation, but the way she does what she does with Jesus, she gets what she came for. And I like that she would not be denied and she's going to intercede on behalf of her daughter. And we're going to talk about that because we're going to look at Matthew's account, Mark's account, and we're going to get into Hebrews uh, because of the show where, where this boldness is something we should also have. So in Mark chapter 7, verse 24, it says, Jesus left that place. He left the area of Capernaum where he was at because uh, he was tired of dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And by the way, if you're one of those people that is actively witnessing, and I am one of those people it's okay to discern when you realize that you're in an argument with somebody that nobody's going to win. There are some people that just enjoy confrontation. Some people that just want to poke you in your side. They want to. Um, they just want to get a response. And no matter what you say, you're never going to break through with them. So you may not. Somebody else may. But but walk away because this is why. What I've learned is that people that love confrontation are often a way of blocking you from getting to a person that needs your attention. Somebody that genuinely wants to hear about Jesus Christ. And the second thing in that is people that are already jaded from the church, when they see people arguing in the church or around the church or Christians arguing or whatever, they just get further turned off. So don't waste your time on people that don't want to be convinced, they just want to argue. So no matter how much argument, you're not going to win them. Walk away. That's okay. You might be missing a very important divine appointment God has for you. So don't waste your time on people. That's why I don't argue online. Just don't do it. It ain't worth it. Um, I'll debate people. I'll go publicly. I'll sit down with people. Um, but I'm not going unless there's uh, either an audience that is genuinely interested or, um, you know, something like that. Anyway, I'm not going to debate just a debate. It's not, it's just, it's just meaningless. So Jesus left that place. He's tired of debating. He's tired of talking to people. It's every, all his truths are falling, uh, falling on dead ears. And he knows how to work a room and he knows when it's time to go. And, and, and we should as well. And he went to the, the vicinity of Tyre, uh, or some people say Tyree. He entered a house there 
but he didn't want anybody to know it. Yeah, you know, he's got to be tired. Remember when, when John the Baptist was killed? Excuse me. He went to a mountain to get away and couldn't get away. Then he went to a house and couldn't get away. He's trying to get some downtime. It's not working out. He did not want anybody to know he was at the house, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. Now, if you're a person that has a child in need, you're going to do whatever you have to do to get help for that child. And here comes the greatest physician that's ever walked the face of the earth. And you're going to find out where he's at. And I love this. This woman digs in and she's like, I'm going to find this man they call Jesus and I'm going to, I'm going to talk to him. I have to get my daughter healed. And we do that today, by the way. Uh, we go to the Mayo Clinic. We go to the Cleveland Clinic. We go to John Hopkins when somebody needs treatment. So, Again, the Bible is extremely relevant. 2,000 years ago, we're going to find the best physician we can for our children. And this woman was doing the same thing. I'm sure she was stressed out. I'm sure she was frustrated. Maybe she was a single mom. We, we don't know. It doesn't say. But it, I'm guessing that's a possibility because it doesn't mention her husband. She's on her own. And she's tough. And I love it. And so um, this woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. Now, number one, when you go to Christ on your face. She is on hit her, her knees. She is on her face. She is bowing to Jesus Christ, our master. And we should as well bow to him. He is Lord. He is Savior. And, and we don't often do that. So the woman was a Greek. This means she is not a Hebrew. She is not a Jew. She is not yet, according to, to most accounts in the Bible, the, the, the word to the Greeks really doesn't get spread until Acts, when Peter thinks around Acts chapter 10. But this woman's breaking all barriers. She, this is even showing how much, uh, showing her inner toughness, knowing that she's an outcast, knowing she's not a Jew like Jesus is, she's still going to find this guy and talk to him. And the woman was a Greek born in Siren Phoenicia, and she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her. Now, we're going to stop there just for a minute and just turn with me then to Matthew 15, because Mark is so quick to go through this story he misses a couple points. So if you go to Matthew 15, let's look at the conversation. A Canaanite, this is Matthew 15, verse 22. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord. Now look at this. She calls him Lord. How many of the followers at the time were calling him Lord? Not very many. And look at this. She even recognizes his lineage. This goes all the way back to Samuel, by the way. Lord, son of David. Wow. Have mercy on me. So she knows. Isn't it interesting that even sometimes, and I run into this too, when we were in cities or we were in the street gangs or working with people that may never go to church, some of them were very savvy when it came to the Word of God. Why? Because they're, seek they're seekers and they're not stupid people. Some people think, well, the drug dealers, people are stupid. They're not. Some of them people are extremely intelligent and many of them are readers and, and some of them were Christians. And this woman, obviously, even though she's an outcast, probably a God-fearer, not necessarily a worshiper, we're not sure, but she knows who Jesus is specifically because somehow she knows the word. He is Lord. Not only is he Lord, but she knows he's Messiah because Messiah must come from the line of David. And she says, son of David, have mercy on me. Again, this is from Matthew 15. You have to compare uh, Mark 7 and Luke, uh, excuse me, and Matthew 15 on, uh, on, these, on this story. Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus, and I, and I wrote these down here. Number one, he ignores her. Jesus ignores her. You ever have your prayers unanswered or you're not sure if they've been answered? I'm not saying God is ignoring you, but he might be testing you. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's testing her. And not only is he testing her for her to strengthen her, to test her, to check, like kind of check her out, but he's doing this for the crowd. And just for an example, I know two people that do this. One of them was my friend Steve Taylor. He owned Basement Waterproofing Nationwide. And if you would work for Steve Taylor and you were a good worker, he would pay for your college education. But if you asked Steve for a job, he would turn and look at you and say, ah, you couldn't handle the job. And that would be his answer. Hey, I'd like to work for you. I hear you pay for college. I'd love to come work for you. And he'd be like, no, nah, that's okay. You probably couldn't handle it. And it was hard work. It was digging up cement out of basements and carrying it up to dump trucks by hand. It was work, but it was a free education. You know, you were, I mean, you were going to work for it, but he would pay for your education. 
And that's the way he would do that. And the reason he did that was says, if I can turn somebody in with words, then I know they can't handle the job. And I love that. And I learned that as a business owner as well. I would say, yeah, it's a hard work. It's heights. You wouldn't like it. And if they walk away, then you knew they didn't want it that bad. So interesting that Jesus does the same thing. How bad do you really want this? In your prayers, how bad do you really want it? Pray, pray, be persistent. Bang on that door with God. Don't give up. Stay on your knees. Keep praying for whatever it is you want or a prayer that you want answered. Number one, he rejects her. It says here in verse 23 of Matthew 15, Jesus did not answer a word. He ignores her. And then his disciples came to him and urged him, you got to send her away. The word here is crazy, something like that, but it's crazy. This woman is crazy. She keeps crying after us. How desperate is she? Even though Jesus ignores her, she is persistent. Are you persistent in your prayers? Are you persistent in your dreams? Don't let anybody turn you away from your dream. Be persistent. Don't just keep driving on. I tell people, have backbone, have guts, drive on. That's what this woman does. She keeps crying out. And this, this actually means she was shrieking. She was screaming to the top of her lungs. Jesus, I need your attention. Maybe we got to pray that way. I don't know if we need an air prayer. So number one, he ignores her and she keeps crying out. Then he pushes back against her. And then he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And she knows she's a Greek. The Bible just pointed that out. So he ignores her. And then he says, sorry, you're not worthy. You're not, a, you're not an Israelite. You're not a Hebrew. You're not a Jew. And so I'm only sent to them. I love that. He pushes back again. But even better, here she comes right back at him. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, now she's called him Lord twice. Son of David once. Lord, help me, she said. And he replied, he, he's going to rebuff her again for the third time. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. It's not right to take this word that I have for, the, for God's chosen people, the Hebrews and the Jews, and give it to the puppies. That's what the word there actually means, and the puppy. So he ignores her. He pushes back. He calls her a dog, and she stays in the fight. So stay strong. I love the fact. And she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Look at how precise she is. Lord, son of David, master on her face before God, begging for her prayer for her daughter, uh, for her daughter to be healed. So let's go back to Mark chapter 7. And so the, the, this is verse 26 of Mark chapter 7, continuing the same study. The woman was a Greek born in Syrophoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Jesus replies, first let the children eat all they want. He told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Of course, we've already said that in Matthew. So he's ignored her. He's pushed her away. He's called her a dog. Yes, Lord, she replies, but even the dogs under the table eat the children. Look at, look at this lowly place. Dogs were meaningless, worthless animals. They were puppies. Actually, in combat, if they gave away your position, we would you'd have to dispose of them, or you'd have to you know, throw them. Whatever. You had to get rid of them. I'm sorry to say that, but it's the truth. They're worthless. In the society, they're worthless. They're, they're just, and this is where she's at. Well, I'm going to put myself in that position if that's where you want me, but I'm here to get what I want. She's not a dog. She's a pit bull. She's dug her teeth into Christ, and she's like, I'm not leaving here until you give me an answer. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, she responded. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And if you go back to Matthew 15, I think he even remarks about her faith. Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. How do we get saved? By grace through faith. How do we live every day of life? It's faith. Atheist or no atheist, you live by faith. Admit it or not, my faith is in my Lord and my Savior. I didn't build the car I drive, the house I live in. There's faith. I don't always make the food I make. We live by faith every day. Love it or, or, or deny it or not, but that's the truth. For such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. Look at the command Jesus has. He he rejects her three times. She comes back at him three times. She digs her teeth into him like a pit bull, doesn't give up. She fights for her daughter, and by faith she wins. Son of David, Lord, have mercy on me. Master, sometimes that's what it takes. Humility. Uh, I wrote this down here. 
she had humility, uh, she had um, boldness, and she had respect. She had humility, boldness, and respect. What we're missing in the world today is humility. A lot is humility. I'm somebody. Everybody thinks they're somebody. Humility, respect. Where's respect? There's almost no respect in a lot of places these days. I do see some, but it's a th it's a dying uh, a thing, a dying characteristic of our society that we used to have respect for one another. And then boldness. Uh, this woman was bold. And again, like I said before, I love a tough girl. I love a bold woman. Uh, it's, that's, that's good. Good on her. And so she's rewarded for her faith, for her boldness, for her humility. Jesus answers her prayer and casts the demon. Look at the authority Jesus has. He casts the demon from a distance out of her daughter. And so she went home, verse 30, uh, and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. So, so this woman may have had some means, too, because the, the baby here, I made a side note, I don't remember when I made this note, but, but if they had a bed, then it was a, often a sign that they had some means, some money. So she may have tried many physicians, and she was extremely desperate because nobody could heal her daughter. So she runs out and finds Jesus and would not be denied. So with that in mind, turn with me to chapter 2 of Hebrews, because I love this. And this applies to us. She's a great example. Ladies, men, don't. if you feel like you're being turned away, be persistent with God. Cry out to God. Be humble with God. But don't give up with God. Because this woman got what she wanted because she was, she was persistent. So if we go to Hebrews chapter 2, the reason I brought this is let's look at some of the characteristics of Jesus just briefly. Hebrews chapter 2, we see Jesus, verse 9. He tasted death for everyone. He is the author of our salvation. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. Uh, Jesus uh, shared in our humanity. This is all characteristics of Christ in the flesh in his hypostatic union. He had to be made like the brothers in every way in order that he might become merciful and faithful. That's just the same thing as like military brothers. When we see each other, we know we've been through a lot. And there's usually a camaraderie there. Why? Because we both understand we've all been through some type of trials, some type of tribulation. We all chewed some of the same dirt, for lack of a better word. And that's why people that, 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 that come together, they have similar backgrounds. You know, you, you have an instant bond a lot of times. And Jesus has that instant bond with us. Why? Because he suffered for us. He was in, he had flesh. He walked around like we do. He had pain like we do. And he isn't ashamed to call us brothers. Therefore, uh, and he was even tempted. Remember that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. There ain't a thing on this planet you're going through that Jesus didn't go through as well. And so, uh, the reason, therefore... Uh, this is going to be in Hebrews 4.14. 4, therefore, with those qualifications that our Savior has, therefore, since we have this great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Why? Because the God that we serve knows exactly what you're going through. Why? Because he's gone through it as well. And then verse 15, for we do not have a high priest, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We don't have a preacher that leads at 40,000 feet. I heard that from a preacher one time, and I just wanted to throw up in my mouth. What preacher is that area? I lead at 40,000 feet. If you want to follow me, you've got to follow me at 40,000 feet. You'll all be on the ground, but I'll be at 40,000 feet. When God himself became a man, God himself was tempted. When he was with uh, among Solomon's colonnades, he didn't hang out with the aristocrats. He was down with the people. That's the worst statement I ever heard from a preacher in my life, by the way, leading at 40,000 feet. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Hebrews 4, 15. Yet he was without sin. Therefore, just like the Syrophoenician woman, just like the Canaanite woman here, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. Go in because, you know what, I'm going to see a Savior that understands me. Ladies, I know I hear that from a lot of women. 
my husband doesn't understand me. And I've even met some guys where they're like, my wife doesn't understand me. I work a lot. I, I don't know what to do. She's upset that I'm not home. But you know what? Both of us, male, female, whatever, you can go to a savior that understands what you're going through because he's been there just like you and I. So let us then approach his throne, the throne of grace with confidence. When we walk in, this is a familiar zone. This is a familiar area. God knows what you're going through. This is not a stranger. He knows you. He cares about you. He knows what you're going through. He, let's just have a conversation so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. I love the way that ties together. Hebrews 4 with Matthew 15 and Mark 7 about the Syrophoenician woman. She went boldly before Christ. Lord, Master, Son of David, have mercy on me. I have a need. Help me. And what does he do? Your faith. I will reward your faith. Faith. So hang in there. If you're going through something today, if nobody's listening to you, if you feel like nobody understands me, I got a person that does. His name is Jesus Christ. And you can read Hebrews 2 through 4. Read the whole book if you want to, because Hebrews is phenomenal for understanding who Christ really is and how he relates to us and how he identifies with what we go through. Why? Because he also has gone through it. So we have a God that is sympathetic to us who can identify with us, that loves us, and cares about us. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need, just like this woman did in Mark chapter 7. So everybody, have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow.